Good morning. Good morning. morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the second Sunday <coughs> in the Advent season. Advent, as we've said in the past, means coming, and we're thinking about the coming of our Savior in three different ways. All right. He comes at the time of his birth to do what he needs to do for us. He comes at the end of time to be our Savior and to be the judge receiving us to himself and those who believe to himself in heaven. And he comes every day in our lives through word and sacrament to produce that faith within us that enables us to be with him now and in eternity. Those are the thoughts for the Advent season. Today especially is that of preparation. Uh, during this time, this week and next week, the ideas of John the Baptist and him coming to prepare the people for Jesus' first coming are very much a part of our lessons for the day. So those are our thoughts today, preparing the way of our Lord as we humble ourselves before him. For you who are visiting us today, you'll find that the service is outlined for you in the bulletin on the side part there, so you can follow that along. Some parts of the service we, we do omit in the beginning portion, uh, but just follow along and we'll direct you as we go. And now I'd ask the congregation to please rise and join with me in the opening portion. We're on page 15, the common service with Holy Communion. Join me for the opening part. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our opening hymn. We join in the singing of hymn number 19. For you who are with us online, this is out of the Christian worship of Lutheran hymn, though. O Lord, how shall I meet you?
page 15. We now begin with the confession of sins as we prepare ourselves to receive the supper of our Lord. <clears throat> Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The congregation may be seated. And we now turn our attention to the scripture lessons for the day. If you care to follow along, you'll find them listed on the back side of the bulletin this morning. The thoughts reflected in our lessons, especially for Advent, is always that of preparation, preparing the way for the Lord, especially in the life of humility, that would be repentance, recognizing our need of all of his gifts towards us in the Savior. Our first lesson today is from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Both this week and next week, the Gospel lesson will center our attention upon the work of John the Baptist. Well, Malachi in the Old Testament lesson today is predicting, prophesying that coming of the messenger. There are two messengers that he's talking about here. One is John the Baptist, who's going to prepare the way for the Savior. But then the messenger of the covenant refers to the Savior himself. We read in Malachi chapter 3. Look, I am sending my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord, whom you are seeking, will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight will surely come, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day when he comes? Who will remain standing when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's bleach. He will be seated like a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and like silver. They will belong to the Lord and bring him an offering in righteousness. Judah and Jerusalem's offerings will be pleasing to the Lord as they were in the days of old, in years long ago. I will approach you to judge you. I will be quick to give testimony against those who practice occult arts, those who commit adultery, those who swear false oaths, those who cheat workers out of their wages, those who wrong a widow and a fatherless child, those who turn away a resident alien, all those who do not fear me, says the Lord of armies. Certainly I, the Lord, do not change. That is why you, sons of Jacob, have not come to an end. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of armies. Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. The epistle lesson today is recorded in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Paul takes our thoughts a little bit more to the second coming of Christ and being prepared at that time. 
as he remembers the Philippians and he prays that God would keep them steadfast, even as the Lord will bring to completion the faith of those in whose faith he has already begun. We read in Philippians 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. Every time I pray for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I am convinced of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I am equally convinced that it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, for both in my chains and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all share in this grace with me. Yes, God is my witness of how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray that your love may still increase more and more in knowledge and every insight. This will result in your approval of the things that really matter, so that you will be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Pilate was governor of Judea, 
Herod was tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis. And Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into the whole region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, just as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough ways smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. And now we unite with all Christians in confessing our faith. Today we do that in the words of the Nicene Creed, as you'll find that on page 18 in the front part of the hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the death, and his kingdom will not have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 21. Hymn 21, Hosanna to the Coming Lord.
morning we look at the gospel lesson for the day. I'm reading in Luke chapter 3. I'll read the closing verses one more time and we'll kind of concentrate on those, beginning at the second part of verse 4. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight and the rough ways smooth and everyone will see the salvation of God. Christ Jesus, their fellow redeemed in our Lord. At the extreme southern part of the Jordan River, just before it flows past Jericho and before it spills into the very harsh and lifeless Dead Sea, there is a ford across the river called the Thabatha. <coughs> Here travelers wade across the river. And for centuries, the traders that were coming from the east, traveling to the west to go to Jerusalem, Egypt, and Africa, came by this spot. It is not a friendly spot on earth. In this whole region, the earth presses downward towards its molten center. It is one of the lowest spots on our planet. It's almost 1,300 feet below sea level. During the summer, the heat is stifling. The air is heavy, and the surfaces of the waters that are there are dark in color. Somewhere nearby, the lost cities of Sodom and Gomorrah once sat. It's said by some that the smell of sulfur still fills the air, reminding them forever that God's patience, although it is long-suffering, it is not inexhaustible. Sin will be punished. It was in this God-forsaken wilderness that John the Baptist was sent. The man called John lived. What a remarkable man this John the Baptist must have been. He lived in seclusion in these yeah. desert regions, for that is where the Word of God found him and then sent him out to be the forerunner to Christ. It had been over 400 years since the last prophet had been sent to Israel with the words, Thus saith the Lord. 400 years Israel's devout had waited, hoping and praying that the Savior, which had been promised long ago, would finally arrive. So long had they waited that many of them had fallen into despair that he would never come. Many of them also had fallen into sin. And then there were others that had turned to false idols, gods that do not exist at all. But now a voice for God called out in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight, you know, in our preoccupation with the affairs that we have of our present day, it may be difficult to, for us to realize just how profoundly John the Baptist's call actually affected the people. But the crowds of Jerusalem streamed out to see him. And we must be just as deeply affected if we are to have a proper Christmas celebration and a meaningful life. For this is not just the cry of a man. This is the call of God to every person. It is the Advent call to us this season. Prepare the way of the Lord. <coughs> now what does that mean? That call first admonishes us as poor sinners. Recognize what you are. For we have fallen into disobedience and sins towards God. We've cut off his way to us. 
that loss we must think about and we must feel if we are really to have a glad Christmas and a happy, fruitful life now and hereafter. We have to painfully recognize what we are if we would have a truly happy Christmas. Think of it this way. It's not the one who is full, but the one who is tormented <coughs> by thirst and hunger who can rejoice when food and drink are finally placed in front of him. It's not the one who is healthy and well, but the one who is painfully feeling his sickness who can rejoice when healing actually takes place. It's not the one who is free, but the one who knows what prison is like, who can rejoice when freedom is finally announced. And it's not the one who is rich, but the one who is oppressed and frightened by his debts, who can rejoice when he hears that those debts have been paid in full. And in the same way, there is only the one who vividly admits that he is a poor sinful being by nature, lost by that nature, who can rejoice from his heart when he hears that a Savior is born. So it is that God's advent call, prepare the way for the Lord, first admonishes us as sinners, recognize who you are and what you are. You know, in truth, none of us can actually do that in ourselves. If it's true that the scriptures say that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, how can a person who is dead recognize that? A dead person is not aware of anything. Therefore, no one can come to such a recognition on his own without God intervening. God requires genuine repentance. A complete change of heart and mind. A 160 degree turn from the way we were going and the way we were thinking in order to be saved. And that change can only come through Him. So God intervenes in our lives. First of all, by giving us His commandments. Taking them in hand. I must quietly look and genuinely look into the bright mirror of the law and examine my life and being in its light. <laughs> I have to stop at each of the Ten Commandments and say to myself, <clears throat> God has here commanded this, that I must put him first in my life, above all people, above all other things, that I must keep his name sacred in every hour of my life. That I must remember his Sabbath day and obey those whom he has placed over me as his representatives in this world. I must be careful not to hurt another person or to harm them, whether by word or by thought or by deed, and so on and so on through the rest. I must stop at each commandment and say to myself, God has here commanded this. Did I do it? Or, God has here forbidden this. Did I really omit that from my life? My dear friends, that is a very difficult task. To honestly look at ourselves and to see what we have not done and what we have done according to God's word. But that's not even enough yet. It's not just about doing or not doing things with my hands. We have to go deeper into our hearts and say to ourselves, I must love, I must fear, and I must trust in God above all other considerations. He must have my entire being. And I must love my neighbor just as myself, even my enemy. Is my heart so inclined that way? See, this is a serious matter. And I must not deceive myself, but recognize what I am on my own as I stand before God 
If I am serious in this matter, and I do not struggle against the Holy Spirit, I have to cry out with King David, My guilt smothers me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. Lord, come quickly and help me. Blessed is the Advent time, this season before Christmas, when a person has such an experience. Because Advent is a season of repentance. It's true that such a season of repentance, or a feeling of repentance, cannot be turned on and off according to the time of the year or the season. Because repentance is a daily need that I have on my own. It's not limited to only certain times of the year. But it is also true that there are certain seasons in our year that lend themselves to a more devoted introspection of myself, which leads me to repentance before him. Isn't that what God's call to prepare the way for the Lord really means? Especially as it came from John the baptizer? The Savior, the long-promised Messiah, was soon to enter upon the scene to take care of our sin. He had not yet begun that saving work among the people. In fact, many did not even know who he was. But John was calling for the people to get ready for his coming, to make straight the way of their hearts for him to enter there without any obstacles that would get in his way. See, that's what the season of Advent means. It is altogether fitting at this time that we devote our thoughts and our attention to the blemished record of the past and to our personal unworthiness before God. But repentance does not stop with recognizing what we are of ourselves. It goes beyond that to receive in faith what God has done for us and made us. Notice what John cries. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, and everyone will see the salvation of God. These things will be done not by the sinner who is unable to do it, but by the Lord with whom all things are possible. As the penitent one hears God's word and recognizes what he is on his own, and then turns to the Lord for help, the Lord provides the way of salvation for him through the birth of his son that we're about to celebrate. And by the gracious operation of the Holy Spirit, penitence leads to faith, and faith leads to joy in what God has done for us. Penitence and faith are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand together. What a blessed Advent time it is when people have such experiences. By preparing the way for the Lord, you become a poor sinner in desperate need, which is reality. And then the gates of your heart will stand wide open for the Lord to enter in his grace. And you can embrace the gospel that is rich in comfort to your soul with the assurance of sins forgiven that come through that Son of God, the Christ. And then, with the longing of one's heart, you will welcome the joyful Christmas celebration. But with such, without such an effort in preparing a way for the Lord, your Christmas is not going to have any lasting effect. It was in a God-forsaken wilderness that a man called John came to be the forerunner of Christ. It's been 2,000 years since his voice called out, prepare the way of the Lord. But his words are just as urgent today in the wilderness of our hearts as they were when Christ first came. God grant that we heed them and do not overlook them, then we will have a very holy night when Christ was born and we celebrate that. We bring repentant hearts to the infant lying in a manger. For honest penitence leads to faith, 
And faith leads to joy in a Savior come. Unspeakable joy. God grant that in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets, like John of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of the Savior. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy to a life of repentance in you. Move us to take to heart the words of John, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let that good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. Fill our lives with that message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger in the days that lie ahead, but also to the skies where we will one day see your son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. As we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. 
And gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would look with mercy on your servants, our family and friends who are facing challenges and sickness, or who are recovering following surgery. Grant them strength of body and mind, and cheering companionship in those who are around them. Surround them with love and respect, concern and understanding, and enable them to accept assistance and healing graciously and thankfully coming from your hand. Keep them strong in the faith and assure them that you will sustain them in every age of life and in every circumstance of life that it may bring. For you will do that through Christ our Lord and Savior. And for all other needs that we have, we come before you in the prayer that our Savior taught us to join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we now continue with the order of Holy Communion on page 21 in the hymn. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always.
the cup here is both the individual and the common cup form. I will pass first of all with the individual cup. If you wish to take that, please take it at this time. And if you wish the common cup, I will pass by once more and provide that for you. And then after our organist has uh, returned again to the organ bench, we'll join in the singing of hymn number 11 during communion. Comfort, comfort all my people. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Now may this is true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
Jesus Christ shed for the remission of your sins. And now may this is true body and blood and give me shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. <laughs> the congregation may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. We join in the singing of hymn number 
14. Please note the stanzas, the last two stanzas, stanzas three and four. Arise, O Christian people. so we hope you can join us then. And uh, for you who are present here today, please make one of the announcements in your bulletin. If you haven't received the forward in Christ for December, they're in the back. Or there are two meditations that could be used for the Advent season, both the meditations, devotions, but also a special Advent series that was produced by our pastors and professors at our college in New Hall. And uh, you might like to take that with you. Uh, then we invite Whomever to remain following the service, we'll have a brief Bible class and fellowship time, and then we'll do the decorating of the church for our Christmas season. Thank you. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.